What I wanted to do for you this evening is ask you a few questions related to what is the glue that holds our world together? Okay? Um, there is a certain super glue, uh, put a little extra adjective on there, super glue, that makes things work. And without it, things fall apart and they don't work. And so with that kind of a question. Let's start with, uh, well, the Ten Commandments is a good place to start. Do we, what's your favorite uh, one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not just say, which ones don't you have trouble keeping? So it must be the favorite because it's the easiest one to deal with. I guess I haven't murdered anybody yet. Ah, thou shalt not kill my favorite one, really, honestly. Okay, what are, what are some of the ones you don't have any problems with? I should, shouldn't say yet. <laughs> Good point. Wedding point has, wedding, uh, hasn't happened yet. Okay, <laughs> what are some of the other ones you don't ever have problems with? Thou shalt not Steel. Steel! It's a great one. Great one. Not my favorite. I have stolen one, so I haven't. Everyone has but I haven't killed anybody. Everyone has at one point. You don't realize for love. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, stealing ideas. Stealing, stealing anything. Stealing anything. Anything, anything that belongs okay. to somebody else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was going to say covet, but then there's probably still some moments of, like, I don't know what they have. Covet's the last one. That's number 10. Mm -hmm. He's getting down into the, um, well, you can tell if somebody steals, they've got something that belongs to somebody else, okay? Killing, eh, usually a body left behind some way. Covet's in the heart. Covet's in the heart, and it's hidden. It's awfully hard to judge that. Mm -hmm. um, really, really tough. What are some of the other ones? They stare on your father and mother. Oh, on your father, your father and mother. Yeah, it's not one of the uh, thou shalt nots, but yeah, it is. It's certainly one of the big ones. Uh, we hit that one about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when we talked about reverence, placing the appropriate value on uh, on what we have been given reverence, honor your father and mother. But you can learn from someone. My dad tells stories about David working on a car. They didn't have really good tools back in those days, and they had to make do with a bunch of junk tools, and the wrench would slip and he would knock his knuckles and he would, but instead of just expressing aggravation or finding a different tool or finding a different way to do it, he would take the wrench, knock the headlights and the window glasses out of the car, just smash the hood and all the things all around, and then throw the wrench as far out into the hay field as he could throw it. Now what did that accomplish? Okay. Now he has to replace all that. Yeah. <laughs> and he only had one. So now you've got to be getting out there in the hay field and kicking around with your feet to try and find where it landed. And you've got to repair all the damage that you've done. Not too smart. Dad learned a great deal from a brother who did everything wrong. We can learn, even then, from parents who don't do it well what we could do better. In fact, that's some of the best lessons Dad ever learned. How to control your anger, how to control your voice, your, your words, how to keep from injuring people and hurting people. We learned a lot of good stuff. Okay, and we're gonna, you can respect even someone who does things wrong and appreciate what they have demonstrated and given you, all right? Doesn't mean you have to feel real good about it. Doesn't mean you have to just feel all warm and fuzzy. But we need to respect that because otherwise we might just do some of the same silly things. It's entirely possible. You know what happens in families? The Bible says, I'm, I'm diverting here just a little bit, that the sins 
of the parents, it says the sins of the fathers, but the sins of the parents are visited on the second and third generation. Now why would it say that? When you're so small, you're sitting on the floor, almost non-verbal, you have no idea what these big tall people are doing or why they're doing it or how they could do it differently. You learn how to cope with life just by watching and picking it up and making it your own. There's a tape recorder in your head that is recording all of those things and will replay them and you will find you're going to be repeating, you're, you're likely to be repeating things that you have heard or felt or seen or experienced for yourself. So you have to put yourself in a position to say, I need to learn how not to do the destructive things that I've been taught or demonstrated or shown, and I have to set my goals on a higher level. Okay? And that really does fit right into our lesson for tonight, because the number nine um, commandment is don't lie. Well, I lied. It doesn't say don't lie. It says don't, don't give false witness to your neighbor, okay, on your neighbor. But the meaning of it is tell the truth, don't lie. We started off talking about the glue that holds our society together. Truthfulness, honesty between people is a very big part of the super glue that holds our society together. Okay? Because if I say to you, it's a wonderful sunny day outside, nice and warm and lovely, and you go out and you're in the middle of a blizzard and you haven't dressed for it and you haven't prepared for it, I'd put you in danger. Now you can't trust me for anything. You can come back inside and say, you lied to me. No, I was just joking. I was just uh, rattling your cage. No, it was a lie. It was a lie. And lies, whether they are large lies or whether they are small lies, is like an acid that corrodes the very fabric of our human relationships. Okay? Um, the word we're looking for is integrity. Okay? The word for tonight, a couple, month, couple weeks ago, it was reverence. Now, this one is integrity. How do you have integrity? Uh, what does the word integrity mean? What does it, when I say integrity, what does that mean to you? How do you, how do you record that in your head? Honesty. Honesty. Yeah. Doing, the right thing when people aren't looking. Doing the right thing, even when no one's paying attention. Okay, something else? I'm sorry. How you hold yourself. How you hold yourself. How you hold people. yourself. Explain that one to me, Glenn. What, how, like would, how you act and uh, not like putting up a front. Ah, I love it. Not putting up a front. Being true all the way through. That, that's the same thing as you had mentioned, having... Integrity is that part that says all of my pieces fit together into a plan. Okay? It's integrated. How would you use integrated into a sentence? Well, we've put all these various pieces of equipment together and we have integrated them into a system. Okay? When we're talking about being a whole person and Okay, we're going to just take a second to go, okay, step back, do a little theology. This is a Wesleyan church, and the Wesleyans and the Nazarenes and several are in the holiness tradition. What does that mean? Well, one of the things it means is 
You don't talk about being free of sin. You do your very best not to sin. Not to be in rebellion against God. Not to do your own thing, even when you know God does not approve and is making every effort to stop you from doing destructive things. Okay? And so the holiness tradition says when you have a commitment, a faith commitment, it makes a difference in the way you behave, in the way you act. Uh, when you are in the holiness tradition, do you lie? You will, but you're not supposed to. I love Glenn's answer. You're going to lie once in a while. You know why? Do you understand why? We're human. We're cowards. <laughs> we don't want to look bad. <laughs> we don't want to get in trouble. Were you doing 65 in that 50 mile? Or, well, I might have been doing 57. You know, I don't want to. Get in trouble. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> now I honestly don't believe I was going as fast as I, I, was. I really don't because I was I'm following sorry. Far, I did, But I did not know I was stepping on. Oh. No, you're good. That's cool. I'm going to court for it. So we're gonna we're gonna see if you actually caught me going 48. So. <laughs> there is a theological scholar and a wonderfully wise man that I will quote now. His pseudonym is Mark Twain. Yay. And he said, <laughs> it does not lie within the heart of any person to tell the absolute total truth about themselves. It can't be done. It simply can't be done. Why? It exposes us to too much risk. Now, having said that, you say, okay, Pastor Bob, what's that mean to you? <laughs> there are things I don't share. There are things about everybody's life we don't share. I wrote an autobiography. So I dictated it into the recording machine. And one of the things I said is I'm completely understanding how difficult this is after having studied the life of Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, and coming to grips with trying to tell the story accurately, but it's almost an inborn necessity to somehow shade out or change the color of some of my failures and poo paws. And I realized he was right. But lying also is destructive to everybody and every relationship. Keeping secrets, not being forthright, not being willing to share. Lying can be not saying the truth just as well as saying things that just didn't happen or didn't happen that way and keeping things quiet is just another form of lying and being dishonest. Um, one of the things I guess I would share with you in trying to show you what integrity means and how much it costs is the King David. First Samuel tells the story of young David after he's been anointed as the new king, but he hasn't been made the king yet because Saul is still on the throne in Israel. Okay? And David is a gifted young man. He is a gifted individual. Um, he is integrated. He is the pure thing all the way through. Remember his fellow, uh, friendship with Jonathan and, 
and the, the, the son of Saul and the, and the tremendous honest relationship they had back and forth to try and help and be partners with each other. He was an integrated person. He was, what, when he spoke a word, it was yes, and his yes was yes, and when he said no, his no was no. And he was an honest, straightforward person. But he also had a bigger sense of integrity. Had he been made king yet? Well, in truth, he hadn't been. Saul was still on the throne. Saul was the anointed one that Samuel had anointed as the first king of Israel. So Saul wasn't behaving like a king should behave. He was doing bad things. He was trying to kill David for one thing, and that was putting David's life in danger. So did that give David the right to retaliate against the rightful king of Israel? No. No. If he would have gone around and got a whole lot of people upset and said, Come on, we've got to rise up and we've got to defeat the uh, anointed one of Israel. He would have been plotting against the established order of what God had put with Saul being in, in that role. All right? I don't want to draw huge, massive things that don't make sense, but when you see riots in the streets in, in Paris, where they're burning cars and breaking into buildings and doing all kinds of damage and destruction, that was a possibility for David too. I mean, if he's out hunting me down, that gives me a right to retaliate and harm he and his family. Right? No. Being integrated means I am going to be responsible for my life and doing it well, no matter what the situations are around me, or what somebody else is doing. Uh, we had Michael Cohen uh, admit in court today. He said, I lost my own moral compass, and when I should have been saying no, I somehow had this shaded sense of morality where I said yes when I should have said, ain't no way. Okay? So he's going to jail for three years. Um, integrity means I'm going to do the right thing even if my friends aren't encouraging me to do it, if my boss isn't, is forbidding me to do it, even if my wife doesn't like what I'm doing. But if it is the right thing to do, I'm going to do it no matter what because that's what God expects of me, integrated. I have integrity. Um, one of the things I guess I come back to is what happens when we break that contract with our neighbors? What, what, what takes place when we say, I'm not going to do the right thing to you, for you? Throws the order out of balance. It throws everything out of yeah. balance. It's, they have expectation that you're going to do right, and you have expectation that they're going to do right. But now that you don't do it right, can you trust them that they're going to do it? No. Trust begins to break down, you see. All of a sudden, we suspect that they are being just as selfish and just as corrupt and just as dishonest as we are. So we start protecting ourselves and building walls and barriers to protect ourselves from people who may not have done anything in the world to harm us, but all of a sudden we can't believe them anymore. The, the beam, Jesus talked about, being in the eye of the beholder actually becomes bigger than the problem we see in the other person because we don't have integrity any longer. We can't see accurately what someone else is actually doing or saying. All right, you follow? Uh, the parable is really easy. 
don't look into the eye of your friend and see a splinter and offer to take it out until you take the beam out of your own eye. You can't do it. So as we decide that we're not going to have integrity, if we decide we're not going to be truthful, everything begins to collapse because instead of having confidence in our neighbors and friends and our brothers in the church, our family, our, our classmates, co-workers, we begin to say, the only way I can protect myself is if I do it to them before they do it to me. And if I don't fight back even harder, they may come back and do something even more to me. But if they're afraid of me, if, they, if I have impressed them with how bad I can be, they may just go pick on somebody else. And the whole order begins to break down. Now here's the, here's the key. Uh, uh, David was so smart. He was so cool. If he would have stood up in defiance of Saul, What did that teach? What would that have taught his army of 600 faithful warriors that he led as their commander-in-chief? His army was 30 mighty men. Each one had 20 in their platoon or whatever it was. And he had 600 faithful, trained warriors that he did amazing things with. Okay. What would he have shown them if he would have gone on the attack against Saul? They could do the same thing. Exactly! I mean, that was perfect. It was like, let me write you the instruction books of how to throw me out of power when you get upset with me. No. Instead, he taught them God's in control here. God's given that person the task and he's ultimately going to hold that person accountable in his own way for how faithfully or unfaithfully he does what he's been given to do. Okay? I, on the other hand, have been given responsibility to faithfully fulfill what I have been given. So, Saul comes running after David. Saul so comes running after David. He's chasing him down in the desert. And David's hiding in the back of a big cave. Saul comes in. It's been a long day. You have to kind of read into the scripture a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's been on that horse a long time, and he needs to use the uh, facilities. So he slips into the cave and drops his drawer. I mean, that's what the scripture says. He covers his feet. and has a moment of meditation. David, very quietly, comes up and quietly cuts in the dark a corner of Saul's robe off and slips back into the back of the cave. After Saul has taken care of business and has returned back to his troops, David comes out to the front of the cave, a nice comfortable distance away from the army, and says, do you see this piece of cloak that you yeah, lost? Something. I was this close to you. I had my knife out. I could have ended your life right here, but I didn't. And I want you to be aware that I didn't do anything to harm you. Okay? Integrity means you can stand up for yourself. You can defend yourself if you want to, as long as you don't do harm in return. Um, that's not the only time. Saul was basically a mental patient at that point and couldn't keep his emotions in check. Um, so he came after David again. And David slipped into camp slipped into Saul's tent 
and took two things from the sleeping corner where Saul was asleep on his cot. He took his, his spear and his drinking bottle and sneaked out of the camp. And from a hillside far enough away, the next morning, everybody woke up and there was David standing. Now remember now, Saul is a big guy. He stood head and shoulders higher than anybody else in Israel. He was one tall dude, an impressive physical specimen, which meant that he also carried a bigger staff than anybody, or a spear than anybody else. And what does the spear mean? Power. Power. It's his sign of authority. My spear is bigger than your spear. <laughs> okay? I'm the big spear guy. What does the water bottle mean? Have to go I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Have to go about. Well, no, there would be plenty of people who would have shared. What, what, what does the water bottle mean? Sustenance. It's, it's what you. It's a necessity of life. Like it's. It is that exactly, but it's also the source of potential danger, because mm -hmm. it only takes a little bit of poison in the bottle until you could be. Yeah killed, murdered at somebody's hand, all right? The water bottle was protected because it was the most vulnerable place that you could receive poison. The camp cook is probably not going to uh, poison you, but somebody can slip any kind of noxious weed seed in there, and you will find yourself dead in the morning if you happen to drink that poisoned water. So, not only was the king supposed to be guarded carefully, not only was his weapons supposed to be guarded carefully, but his source of survival was supposed to be guarded carefully. And even then, David was able to slip in, steal those two items, and say, you see, I'm not doing you any harm. Being a person of integrity means a little bit like a Hippocratic oath. Uh, do no harm while you're doing good. <laughs> Just don't do harm while you're trying to do the right things. And sometimes it's very, very difficult, even for people inside the church. And you're right, we do tend to shade the truth or tell the inaccurate things to protect ourselves. We don't want to be exposed. Yeah, one of the preacher grades, I don't know whether you know what preachers have to put up with or not. You don't know what a preacher grades? Okay. Uh, for now 40 plus years, I have dreamt that I couldn't get to church on time, I wasn't dressed properly, and was, let's say, dressed minimally, <laughs> running through the church building trying to get myself pulled together so that I could get ready to stand and do the thing I had to do for Sunday morning. All right? Standing in the pulpit naked is the preacher's curse. Three. Why do you suppose that is? We don't want to be exposed. We don't want to show our weakness or our vulnerability or our shallowness, our inconsistencies. What are some of the other words we might be trying to cover up? We don't want to come our faults. Our faults, our imperfections. Humanity. Our humanity. And so we spend our Saturday nights dreaming of trying to fight our way through the basements and the labyrinth of spaces to try and get up to where we need to be when we're not prepared and we will be exposed for being badly
prepared to share. Okay? That is the preacher's dream. All right? Nightmare. But it's not unique to preachers. It's not unique to pastors. If we have failures, if we have shortcomings, how are we supposed to deal with them? With integrity. David also tells us how to do that too. Remember? He had a little problem. Her name was Bathsheba. <laughs> How did he handle his problem with Bathsheba? Not with integrity. Not with integrity. He decided to try to cover it up. Tried to be dishonest. He actually tried to get uh, her husband home from the war so that he could claim that the child that Bathsheba was carrying, which was really his, was actually a legitimate child from that wedding, from that marriage. And the husband wouldn't go home. He said, that's not right and for me to be at home having my comforts when all the rest of the army is out there fighting the battles. Um, I'm not going over there. That sort of integrity, and you know, I'm going to be faithful to the calling I've been given, the task I've been given by my king to be a faithful warrior. Well, since that didn't work, uh, David got him drunk and tried to send him home. <laughs> and that didn't work. And so finally, he sent him back to the front of the war with instructions to have him put at the very front lines of the battle, and at the very most critical moment, pull the rest of the army back and leave him stranded out there by himself without defense. And he was killed. So, that meant that David was free to take Bathsheba, who's now a widow, and marry her and bring her into the palace. How did God show him that was a really bad decision? Remember the and Nathan, from Nathan the prophet. Oh, he's yeah, the sheep parent. Right? The stealing of the mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh -huh. exactly. should be killed. That man is you. <laughs> he is you. You are the man. And what was David's response when he realized that he had been found out? Is there a button? He went crying to the temple, grabbed a hold of the horns of the altar, which are the handles, the ornate decorations on the, end, on the ends and the corners, and grabbed onto it and said, nobody's getting me out of here until I have been forgiven by God for what I've done wrong. <coughs> that is repentance with a passion. And repentance is not done with a passion is not repentance at all. Um, let me say it differently. Most people don't like to get caught. So they say they're sorry or they apologize when they've been caught. What's missing? Anyone wants to be caught doing anything wrong. I'm sorry, what was that? I don't think anyone wants to be caught doing anything wrong. No, nobody wants to. Nobody wants to. The sincerity. The sincerity? How do I measure sincerity? Other actions after they say it, you're so, they're sorry. They'll show you? Is that what you said? I'm, I'm their sorry. Actions, so actually, after they their say actions, they're sorry you. if they. Okay. Are they going to do it again or are they actually sincere and change their ways? Go ahead and hit it exactly in the spot. And here's the thing that's missing for most apologies I apologize for the act, but I don't apologize for the desire that led to it. Or I'm sorry. Well, we don't say it that way because that's just a little bit too honest. No, we don't. That's <laughs> not I, have, I actually have a friend that's done that before. He would actually say, I'm oh, sorry, I got caught. Yeah, I saw <laughs> And he would go do it again. Well, like, no. when the judge says, 
what your what your sentence is, I'm a little bit like calling it, he adds time on the end because you haven't really gotten it right yet. Here's the here's the deal. Every sin starts with a desire. Every Jesus said it best in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, don't commit adultery. Well, it's looking with desire that leads to the act of adultery. All right? Don't commit murder. Well, but it's the, act, the attitude of being angry and contemptuous toward our brothers that leads us to do actions that harm and damage each other. So the desire, the driving force behind our sinful action is the desire that we have that precedes the action. All right? If you say to somebody, I'm sorry I lied to you, but I'm probably going to do it again because I still have the same feeling that I don't want to be exposed and I don't want to let you see how bad I actually am on the inside. They're going to lie again. If they have stolen from you and they say, I'm sorry that I stole this from you, but they don't apologize for the desire, the covetousness or whatever it is that they had in their heart that wanted something to belong to you, then they're probably going to steal from you again. The reason why we have integrity is that we reject even the thought of unfaithfulness. We reject even the ideas that lead us to actions. We reject the attitudes that lead us into becoming an unfaithful person, a person without integrity. And because we, we set aside anything that pretends to be okay, we are insincere, which you use the right word, we're not sincere, it eventually shows up in our actions. Okay, you follow? And you are absolutely right. Our actions prove, but our actions are still always following our desire. So, if you say, my hand has offended me, okay, Jesus using the, if your eye offends you, pluck it out, if your hand offends you, cut it off, what's he saying? We should go around all crippled up? Get no. rid of the things that lead you yeah. to stumble. Go to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is not your eye, it's not your hand. It's your head, it's your heart. And if you don't get to the root of the problem, you're just going to keep having the same issues over and over and over again. Okay? That's the way to live without integrity. Integrity means dig out the root of what is causing us to want to rebel against God. Um, sanctification is, is an issue that is a little more difficult because once in a while we misunderstand the word. Sanctification doesn't mean we're perfect, but we've gone through and tried as much as, with, as, as was, is within us to dig out the roots of sinful desire. That's what it means. To go in and plow deep so that we're starting with a fresh place to plant God's seed. All right? That's not going to be a perfect situation because just because we live in this world, there are going to be things that fall in there it's going to sprout up, and it's going to cause us problems. That's the way Satan works. That's the way our world works. But if we are not aggressively searching for a way to dig out the roots, and that was what David did. Um, we talked about how he taught his 600 warriors how to be faithful by being faithful to Saul, all right? Not going after him and not, not trying to take his life and take the throne. Um, what did his failure with Bathsheba teach his family? Just take what you want. Because 
son pretty much did the same thing. A young man family. named Abdusalan. Yeah. He had the opposite problem with Jonathan's stuff. Long curly locks. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absalom, the man with the beautiful hair. Beautiful boy. Uh, he sings at the end, my beautiful boy, my beautiful, beautiful boy. Well, that was Absalom. He was David's beautiful boy. But he ended up trying to revolt against his father. And, you know, my dad's not perfect. My dad's seen better days. He's weak. He doesn't need to have uh, respect. So I'll just take over in his place. All right? He wasn't the only one. There were uh, sons that took sexual advantage of their sisters and all kinds of things in the family. Once we set the pattern, our families will follow what the pattern that we set. Because integrity has to be learned. It cannot come any other way. I, I'm thinking of all the things I've learned through the years. I've never seen anybody automatically become a person of integrity. I don't think I've ever seen it happen. There was always someone in their life. Oh, I had a buddy. Um, we were all little. His parents had completely failed him. Totally. Totally failed him. He was living with his grandma and grandpa. They were elderly. This was a boy that could very easily have had a messed up, terrible life. Except grandma and grandpa had integrity. And he learned how to be a careful, wise, faithful follower of Jesus Christ because he had someone of integrity demonstrating that for him and walking along with him. They were of a different generation. They were elderly. They were weak. They didn't have, they couldn't get down and play ball and do all the things like a, a mom and dad would have done with him. But there was somebody with integrity that they could hook on to and include. Integrity is a learned quality. And that means two things to us. It means two very important things. We need to be persons of integrity. We're holiness. That seems to go without saying. No, I think it still needs to be said. <laughs> But the other half of it is, we need to take people into our circle and show them what integrity means. Because if we don't, they learn what the lack of integrity means. Uh, we had a pastor who had a morals problem. You would say, that's a terrible thing. It ruined his family, it ruined his marriage, it ruined the the kids, they all had to struggle with the fact that one of the parents didn't do it right. Okay? They all learned. They did it well. But they had to learn it the hard way. They had to learn how not to do it first. Okay? But six additional families in the church also failed. In the next three years after he left the church. Where did that come from? Mm -hmm. Somebody that you depended on, that you looked up to, respected, that you were learning from. And we got it wrong. I'm sorry, I get one at a time. So just give me a second, Glenn. What was that? I was gonna say it doesn't sound like they killed it every like they Killed it at the source. No, they didn't. They didn't kill it at the source. History repeats itself if you don't change it. How does Jesus say we're supposed to deal with sin in the body? Matthew 18, 15. How does he say to do this? If your brother sins, 
go to him, explain what the sin is. If he repents, you re you restored your brother. If he decides not to listen, take two or more, yeah. and you go to them and you do it with witnesses so that you can say, we know what's happening, we understand what's happening, we want you to be restored. All right? It's not with punishment, it's not with judgment, but it is with truthfulness and a sense of wanting to be restored. If that person refuses, what's the next step? You bring it to the church. That's tough. Do you know why it's hard for church leaders to bring someone who is sinful to the church? Because in their own hearts they say, that could have been me. It, it, it could be that they're talking about something I've done or thought of doing or may have had problems with in the past. We don't want to. It's hard. I think in some instances, like in our society, it's, it's bad publicity. Like like the whole thing we're going with colleges and with like the gymnastics, you know. Fantastic it's, it's, example. It's, it's, it's like we don't want to seem like something's wrong, so we want to cover it up as much as we can. Mm -hmm. In the church, you will find that the Catholics... Right now, or in the middle oh, of the too, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Just why haven't just... they, why didn't they kill it at the source? Because they didn't bring the priest before the body mm -hmm. and say, this person has failed you. Yeah. He has let you down. We are removing him from position. We're removing him from authority. And we are taking him into the, the woodshed, mm -hmm. theologically speaking. And until he shows the correct responses, he is out of the body. And what does that tell all the rest of the priests who are thinking about it? These people are serious. You don't do it. And they say, he just wasn't good as I am as covering up. I know I can keep a secret. I can just keep on going. Honestly, that desire is a bad root that gets down into the heart, and it's tough to dig it out. But if you don't do it the way Jesus said to do it, even the body of Christ is supposed to be bringing them back to restoration. But if they don't, then they're outsiders. They are outside the family. Read 1815 again. Read 1815. It is a really powerful instructions on how to handle sin in the body. And every single time I have seen a church say, well, we don't have to do it this time. We don't, you know, that that would destroy that person's business. It would destroy their marriage. It has the possibility of causing them to be alienated from their children. That's not what we're going to do. We can't do that um, can we? So what have we taught the family of God? We can compromise, not do it right, and if you're good, cover it up. Do what you want to, and just so they ignore what the Bible says altogether. Now, my my friends, like I, I do this because I'm not angry at anybody, and I. I try and be friends with people who make mistakes. I try and be, you know, I had a friend of mine who divorced his wife, tried to be a pastor, and got married to another lady just to think that he could. It, it was a mess. I hurt for him. I hurt for the whole family. I hurt for everybody involved. But I told him the truth as powerfully and as lovingly as I could. I have delivered my soul. I have been on leadership teams that had to deal with pastors that were doing unethical things. And we brought them in and held them accountable exactly step by step, exactly according to Matthew 18, 15, brought them to the church 
exposed what had been done, and you know what the church said? We know he's got a lot of problems, but we like him. We're going to go ahead and keep him. Within a few years, the church is completely dissolved and gone. Why? The community will not accept the testimony of someone who doesn't have integrity. They didn't save themselves the harm or the, the damage. They just multiplied it because they saw it, they knew it, they accepted it, and they went ahead and let him continue to do the bad things. Every time. My dad took me over to the cemetery where his tombstone had just been installed. And it had a number of Christian symbols on it and Reverend Tom in front of his name, you know. And he said, if I follow up during the last of my life, I'm counting on you, my old son, to come over here with a hammer and chisel and knock those things off. Because if I don't have the integrity, I don't want somebody saying he claimed one thing and did another. That's the way it is with all of us. And there are, there are times when we have to say, in all humility, I don't know if I'm going to mess up. I don't know what my future is going to hold. Uh, same thing to be quite creative. But the point is, don't. Don't think you're doing me any favors by not telling the truth. Don't think you're doing anybody any favor by being dishonest about how you take care of things. And so it's, it's very important, okay? Being a person of integrity is the thing that holds everything together. You can't have a body of Christ work like it's supposed to if all the people working together do not have that same hunger and thirsting for righteousness that gets rid of anything that would kill the spirit, destroy the body, destroy the relationships. Okay? Do you have any questions on me? That, that, that's kind of a hard lesson. That's, that, you're riding down some hard old back roads with a lot of potholes in them. <laughs> you kind of have to go, ooh, wow, that hurts, you know that? It's future Kansas roads. <laughs> so it's not an easy lesson to get your head around, that's for sure, but 